Uh, my name is Justin Patton. I've uh, worked for uh, the Faculty Development Center for a few years, and prior to that, when there was no Faculty Development Center, it was the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology. And it was about 10 years ago that I came on board, and when I stop and think where screen capture software was 10 years ago versus now, it's pretty uh, entertaining because back then, 10 years ago, it was a really big deal to be able to screen capture a, a PowerPoint. PowerPoint did not have that you know, built in, um, and so somebody who did that was a big deal. You know, they had definitely gone above and beyond to go out and find screen capture software uh, to use in addition to capturing their PowerPoint and doing a voiceover. Um, so, you know, screen capture, when I first started using it, I looked at it exclusively as something to do a voiceover with on my PowerPoints. That's, the, that's all I thought of. Um, and that was a really, you know, probably one of the most useful things to do. Uh, eventually, PowerPoint caught up and decided they're going to integrate this, you know, functionality with PowerPoint, which made total sense. Um, that I'm not. Do you remember what year that was that 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 PowerPoint started doing that? It was. It's been. A f it's been a few years now. It hasn't just been like the last one or two. It was probably three or four years ago. I'm not sure. Um, but once they did that these other companies that had largely been kind of, you know, riding on the coattails of the need for that, I think started having to, to come up with ways to still remain relevant. Uh, so ScreenFlow 6 is um, kind of the fancy version for Mac. There is a Camtasia version. Uh, you've heard of Camtasia before. Um, so Camtasia will run on PC or Mac, and it's a great program for both of them. Um, I've used Camtasia a lot. But when I decided to buy something for myself, um, I researched Camtasia and I researched ScreenFlow. And there's a few things about ScreenFlow that I really liked um, better. For one thing, it's, it's cheaper. If you buy the top dollar version of Camtasia, it's running about $300 now for a person that's just going to go out and buy it for themselves if, they don't have to, if they're not going to deal with you know, getting a, a license for the whole unit. Whereas ScreenFlow is about 100 bucks, so you know, about a third the price. Um, the other thing that's great about ScreenFlow, because it's just for Mac, it's really a better fit. Whereas Camtasia started out as a PC program, and then they made a version for Mac. Um, there are little things that Camtasia doesn't do quite as well, um, and certainly the, the price is one of those things. So I'm going to look at some of these basic utilities. Uh, aside from doing screen captures, uh, both Camtasia and ScreenFlow are basic video editors. You could use them to pull movies in and, and actually edit things out. You know, chop it up, rearrange it. You can um, use pretty common video editing tools like uh, you know, color correction, even chroma key for somebody who, uh, that was a big deal too. 10 years ago when we first started doing uh, videos for faculty, our big thing was we had a green screen and you could come shoot in front of the green screen and we could then kind of make it look high tech by putting you either in like a completely white background so that you didn't have kind of the dingy office look. Um, that was kind of fun for a while, but then people got tired of that. It was a lot of work for not a whole lot of payoff other than it looked slick 10 years ago. Now in 2017, it doesn't look particularly slick. Um, neither do all those fancy spin around uh, transitions and wipes. And you remember all the things PowerPoint had with it when you if you really wanted to, you could make words fly across the screens. You could have all types of crazy stuff that some of us chased at uh, when it was brand new, thinking that it was going to help our presentations be better. And now in 2017, most of us realize that that's not the way to go. Uh, and students will even tell you that. Please, please don't make it any fancier than it has to be for me to get the information. So that same issue arises again with ScreenFlow and Camtasia because they give you a lot of these transitions and little effects that if you're going to use, you know, just like with a PowerPoint presentation, it's really wise to use it very, very sparingly and for a very specific reason, you know, if you're going to use something at all like that. Um, so I can do video editing with either one of these. I think it's a better video editor probably than iMovie um, in some ways. It's going to be more flexible in that you can spit out a, a larger variety of file types you can import a larger variety of file types. Um, it's just more, uh, it's hard to imagine that iMovie is not a user-friendly program, 
but ScreenFlow is probably even more, more intuitive than, than iMovie for those types of things. And it's also an audio recorder. So if I have somebody Skype in to my laptop, I can fire up ScreenFlow and start recording just the audio. And then I can have uh, you know, uh, any type of Skype interview recorded and saved that I could share with students if I wanted to. Um, so it's really a great tool to have for a variety of just simple utilities. Um, and then again, we're gonna get into some of the things that it does uh, specifically. I'm gonna go ahead and pull it up here. Open up this um, the screen capture that I did of one of my keynote presentations. So this is another interesting point. If you're using a cloud-based um, pre presenter program, so so there's keynote for Mac is like PowerPoint, but there's a there's a hard hardware version where you actually have keynote living on your computer, and then there's keynote in the cloud which is a very stripped down version of Keynote um, that doesn't do a lot of the things that, that the, um, and it's free, you know, if, if you've got a Mac and you, you have a, a Mac account, which, uh, which may cost something, I can't remember, if you have like Mac Mail and all, and all the iCloud stuff, it's, it's pretty cheap. But the point is, is that the, the cloud-based version is much less feature rich than the version that lives on, on your machine. So for me, when I use the cloud-based version, I, you know, and, I, and I'm assuming if PowerPoint had a cloud-based version, it would follow the same principle of being a lighter version versus something that lives on your machine. You might not have access, like I don't with Keynote, to some of the features that ScreenFlow gives me. So I can keep ScreenFlow for all the other reasons I mentioned earlier and then use it with my PowerPoint slash uh, Keynote Lite um, in order to, to do my screen capturing. ScreenFlow being, being the, the, the one we're talking about today. So I'm just going to go back to the beginning here. What you'll notice here in this window, this is just my, my screen, and I've got Keynote up, which is my slide presenter. I've got my slides right here, and then this is the slide that I happen to be on, and I just see my whole desktop here. And then inside um, this uh, timeline is audio, so these guys are audio, and below that is my, my video. And it splits it up for you nicely. Um, and this is where you can do a variety of specific things. If I wanted to work just on audio, I can come to my audio tab, you know, increase the volume very easily. Um, I can add a variety of effects to things. Um, I can give it reverb if I want reverb. Uh, if you're trying to do something silly like that, I don't usually need that. But it, it gives you all those extra tools, even to the point of if you have, um, well, Apple ships with a bunch of audio tools that comes with GarageBand. So ScreenFlow can go use the Apple GarageBand tools for itself because those are called plugins. So those plugins will work with any, any software that recognizes those types of plugins. Um, there are audio processors called compressors, and what the compressor does is it takes the quietest part of your voice or whatever you're recording and the loudest part and just kind of reduces the dynamic range. And this is really handy because once you reduce the dynamic range, you can bring the whole thing back up and it makes it much easier to hear your voice sounds almost like that radio DJ quality. It's big, it's in your face, uh, and you don't lose it as easily as you might if you just left it flat. So. Again, you know, these are kind of handy things, if, if tricks for the f folks that are trying to make uh, their productions look extra, extra fancy or sound extra nice. And then if I want to get off of the audio and down to the video, I have the same types of, of uh, things here, control colors, video filters, and we can do a lot of these types of um, uh, stylizing or just ad adjusting the color. Sometimes a color will look funny for some reason, the light was weird, maybe the fluorescence wash you out and you look like a ghost, you know, <laughs> for whatever reason you think, oh, I look ill, I look like I'm sick, and it's, it's, sometimes you can just really f make things look a lot more natural if it was shot in strange conditions with a simple color adjustment. And so these are all those types of things that you'd expect to find uh, with a video editor. One of the things that I really like, and this is something that Camtasia does not do, 
find it here. Here we go. So I'm playing back the movie now, and you'll see that um, the mouse is moving. You see the mouse fly in there? What I want to do is come over here to the mouse pointer, and I can zoom in or out and make that mouse really big after the fact. And that's pretty handy because if you think about people watching videos that are embedded in something, very rarely is the video going to be the full size of their screen. It's going to be just a, a box, right, like a YouTube uh, embed. And if that's the case, sometimes it can be really hard to follow that little cursor around. And so it's such a great feature to be able to come in after the fact, after you've recorded, and adjust the size of the cursor as, as you move around trying to show people um, what, what you're doing. I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure Camtasia does not have this, this effect. It's not a big deal, and yet I, I really like it. I'm really excited about the, op the, the option there. Because again, you're doing it after everything's done. This is in the editing process. You've already captured your, your screen presentation. And now, even though I've captured it as that, uh, as that moves around, now it's huge. It's going to pop out really well from an embed. Something else you'll notice is right here, I'm capturing whatever my, my keystrokes happen to be. So if I'm trying to teach um, how to use uh, AutoCAD or any type of, of software that is heavy on the hotkeys, then the hotkeys show up right there if I want them to. Whatever keys I'm using during my, my screen capture will show up if I choose. Um, that way I don't have to necessarily say all the time, Command A, Command C, Command V. Uh, I can if I want to, but, but it's also up there. So I really like uh, those two issues there. We'll watch here as I copy and paste, and you'll see those hotkeys pop up again. Command C, Command V. So that's just a real quick uh, demonstration of, of the basic screen capturing, which we would do with PowerPoint. Is that is all making sense? Do you have any questions at that point? All right, great. I'm going to go a little bit further into... Um, what this guy will do. This, is, this reminds me a little bit of um, Photoshop, because Photoshop is a really um, deep program. And most of the people that I know don't need um, anywhere near the depth that Photoshop offers. So ScreenFlow is similar in that you can go, you, you, can, you can almost look at it as, as a Photoshop thing or, or a uh, flash, um, uh, not quite a programming level type flash issue, but it'll, it'll do all types of things. We'll, we'll look at some of them right here and then we'll talk about going further, which I haven't quite figured out how to justify yet for educational purposes. Um, so what I did here, I just flew in a picture of a piece of hardware that I want to train students on how to use this piece of hardware. Just grab this picture right off the web and, and brought it in. Here's my media library, so there's, there's the picture. And then uh, here's my, um, my microphone uh, audio that I, I recorded right, right on top of um, the laptop's built-in mic. And I also flew in this picture of, of a USB icon. I'm going to play a little bit of this, and you'll see some of the things that ScreenFlow can do. You, you can watch down here. Here is my vocal, uh, my audio track. Here is the video track, and then each one of these little purple or blue things is an action that I'm performing. And then this top area here is my closed captioning. Uh, so I can actually control my closed captioning with ScreenFlow, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. I really like the closed captioning feature. I've done more than I should with this for demonstration purposes. It's a little bit heavy on the effects that I just said we probably shouldn't use too much of. <laughs> so I'll uh, warn you about that. So what we're looking at here is the IE22 audio interface from Audient. This is a two-channel USB audio interface that plugs into your computer, so you can use any type of standard microphone. So. Real simple things, all this type of stuff is, is standard fare for, for Camtasia or for ScreenFlow. Um, even though when we zoom in, 
uh, we, we remember that this area that's um, not grayed out is our, is our visible area. So I can see a grayed out portion, but this would not show up on my, on my final movie. My final movie is only going to be in this area here. So I'm zooming in just on the manufacturer's name as I talk about what it is. This is a two-channel USB audio interface. That and then I do my little USB flash, which arguably may or may not need to be there, but that's one of those fun things that you can do when you very easily bring it in and, and make a visual cue as to what you're talking about. Plug into your computer so you can use any I'm going to skip ahead. We'll watch what some of these callouts are going to do. Uh, you have between 0 and 60 dB of gain, which is usually what you need for all types of microphones. Beneath that control is a 48 volt on-off switch, which is your phantom power, so you can uh, use condenser microphones if you choose. There's also a 10 dB pad in case you're using a really hot microphone, um, or if your source is very, very loud, and you need to attenuate that. Also included is a uh, phase polarity inverter. In case you're recording with two microphones that happen to be out of phase with each other. And lastly, a very useful bass roll-off to get rid of your very low-end stuff that you're really just going to add to the end of your recording. We have a large master volume control, which lets you uh, adjust your speaker monitor so you're connected to the speakers. And a headphone control that comes with it as well. We have a dim and a touch button, which lets you either kill the output speakers or just reduce it. And then there are three function buttons, F1, F2, and F3, and those can be assigned to any number of different tasks. Uh, typically, the F1 function button features as a summing to mono button, so you could speak back to whoever you may be recording in a different room. So that's nothing more than just a bunch of actions applied to a, a JPEG. And so I can go in there and just highlight all these different areas um, on a JPEG. It's not even really a slideshow. We're just doing these these little call-outs to highlight certain areas. And that's probably my, my favorite type of call-out. There are a variety of different styles. Um, I kind of like graying things out and bringing up the one that I'm talking about. Uh, you can also just circle them, or you could zoom in like I did with, with the audience thing, which I think after a while that would be a little too much for me, <laughs> zooming into each area. I, I like this idea a little bit better. And circling things is OK, but it doesn't get you, give you a closer look at it. So I kind of like uh, these types of call-outs which give you a slightly closer look at things. There are so many other little tricks that I think probably could be useful, but I haven't found out a great way for them to be useful uh, in terms of animations, um, to the point that you can even create your own uh, GIFs. And I watched about an hour and a half presentation on creating GIFs just in ScreenFlow. And it's not nearly as bad as creating GIFs in, in Photoshop, but you've got to have an educational reason to create your GIF, right? It can't, you know, or, or maybe you're just trying to, maybe we want to have a big faculty development center thing that flies around on our website and goes, whoop, I don't know, you know. But so you can do stuff like that with ScreenFlow. Um, when I was in initially conceptualizing this, uh, I was thinking, well, maybe I could make this a, a GIF, an animated GIF that does all that. But, you know, a GIF needs to be short. It doesn't need to be a, a two-minute long animation. Uh, so that's definitely there. ScreenFlow can do it. I just haven't figured out a reason for me to need to do it yet, but it is there. And it can do all those types of, of, of animations to whatever else I want to bring in. I also want to show you, let's see where we're at here. Show captions. So we're going to take a look at the captioning now. So each one of these little guys, when I, when I enable the caption track, I have all these little breakdown boxes that are about three seconds long. And I can go in and, and, and type in my captioning. Um, it is a lot of work to have to type in everything that you have said, especially if it's a long presentation. And after all, YouTube will do this automatically for you. You just have to say, enable captioning. But YouTube does not do it perfectly. Um, I'll show you a little bit about what YouTube does and doesn't do well here. Here's my movie uploaded to, to YouTube with YouTube's automatic captioning. So what we're looking at here is the IP22 audio interface from Audient. This is a two-channel USB audio interface that plugs into your computer so you can use any 
kind of a standard microphone. Um, you can see that there are several controls you can take. The first thing to notice is there are uh, two main controls, one for each channel. We just talked about one channel for sure because it's the same other. And you have between zero and 50 dB of gain, which is usually plenty for all types of microphones. The mini pass control is a 48 volt on off switch, which is a phantom power, so you can uh, use either your microphone if you choose. There's also a So it, it does a really good job. There were a couple of mistakes in there. If you, if you caught them, it, it, it said bass as in B-A-S-E for, you know, I just stole first bass, not B-A-S-S -S for low frequencies. And at some point, it also, um, audience, audience instead of audience. And there was a place, I didn't, I didn't find it, where, I, where it, it interpreted something that I said as diamond. Oh, I know where that is now. It's over here. Right there, dim and a cut. It thought I said diamond. There it is, a diamond cut button. So, so these are the types of things that you know you have to live with if you're going to try to use the freebie, quick and easy Google um, closed captioning. And it's pretty good. I mean, it's pretty good considering that I've got to spend a lot of time typing. This is a very attractive feature, but still there may be times when you just can't accept any type of mistakes, and that's where being able to type it in comes in. Um, when I play the... Oh, you know, I haven't, I haven't tried that yet. I haven't tried editing the closed captioning. You probably can. Um, what ScreenFlow will let you do is export what they call an SRT file, and there are a lot of programs that will let you do that, and then you upload that SRT file to the video that you want to give the closed captioning, and it ends up looking like this. So what we're looking at here is the IP22 audio interface from Audient. This is a two-channel USB audio interface that plugs into your computer, so you can use any type of standard microphone. Um, you can see that there are several controls you can take. The first thing to notice is there are uh, two main controls, one for each channel. So this one doesn't do the, the you know, word for word as it kind of comes along. It just gives you a chunk, and then it gives you the next chunk. Um, and some of these didn't match perfectly, and that's because I chose to leave some words out that I didn't think had to be there um, for, uh, for the closed caption. Uh, me throwing out extra words that I didn't need to use, which I do a lot of, and then when I go back, I said, I can cut a lot of these words out. So... Um, there aren't any mistakes in this. It's just a, a, this is what I've chosen to use as, as the closed captioning. So that's one instance where you're not going to have any words that surprise you. Um, I'd have to go back and look to see if, if, if Google or if, if YouTube will let me fix their automatic closed captions. It must. It must. They, they, they must say, it probably recognizes it, and then, then they have an algorithm that says, get rid of it. We don't want um in there. <laughs> because you're, yeah, right, very nice. They, they were smart about that. And so when I am um, working with any of these YouTube videos, under the, under the subtitles slash closed captioning, adding the new subtitles, this is where I would upload my SRT file so that I could give it exactly what I want it to say um, versus my other file, which was this guy. I just said use English, auto automatic English subtitles and it did a really good job, really close. I would imagine that most of the time that would probably work for most people um, as long as it's not just a super critical thing. I just like the idea of being able to go in there and, and make it look just the way I want to make it look. 
So here we, and, and, and so, and you can come in here and, and there, there they all are. And they're, and they're showing up just the way they did for um, the channel. And if I want to edit something, I can come in here and make, you know, that block five seconds or three seconds. I can decide how long it's going to go. I can, uh, can change it. I can stack them. Um, and it'll all end up fitting more or less the way I want it to. So finally, any, any, any questions at this point? Is, is this more or less what you expected from a screen, screen capture software? Um, yeah. Cool. You know, I don't have any preconceived expectations. So. Well, when I use it, um, I don't often go quite uh, as involved as this. A lot of times I really am just using it to capture um, whatever I'm doing on the screen. It's not even a, it's not even a PowerPoint presentation. It's like, well, here's how we're going to use this software, right. or here's where we're going to go on the web to, for you to look something up. You know, it's like a tutorial that tells you how to use a database maybe. Right. So they're just watching me you know, talk and, and work. Um, in fact, pull that back up again here. Most of um, my lectures that I have online bounce back and forth between the light board, which is right next door over here, um, which you, you've probably seen. Have you seen the light board before? I've seen it. Okay. Um, I don't... I... Uh, it's just it's just a great online chalkboard is all it is. So what I what I'll do is um, just face the students and and use it like a chalkboard. Right. And so this is this is for a class. It's not an online only class. It's a flipped class. So they have homework where they have to watch these lectures and then they come into class and we do projects based on the the knowledge that we've tried to lay down. So what I what I have a lot of uh, is lightboard and then um, screen captures. So this right here would be what I'm doing with ScreenFlow mostly. Just very simple, you know, showing how to do a certain thing. What I really like for me, and I think this will become more important in, in, in the future, ScreenFlow, a, a lot of these programs that handle audio they handle audio in a very, very simple way. And, and if somebody's working with lots of different types of audio, like I am in, 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 in music and for recording, I need to be able to capture, you know, a microphone going into the computer, which, you know, Camtasia or PowerPoint can do. But I also need to be able to capture system audio, which they can do. But I may also need to be able to capture six or seven or eight additional channels of audio. And a PowerPoint's not going to be able to handle, handle eight or 12 extra channels of audio discreetly, where it's like, okay, how many sources do you want to plug in? Whereas ScreenFlow will let me plug a big uh, digital mixer in, and it'll follow all these different channels. Mm -hmm. So things like that make, you know, for, for somebody who's trying to teach a recording class, mm -hmm. I'm using these more advanced audio tools, and ScreenFlow can keep up with it. Whereas Camtasia cannot keep up with it, and um, PowerPoint certainly can't keep up with it. So that's one of the things that it's not going to matter for a lot of people, but it's really crucial for me uh, for ScreenFlow to be able to do that. So when we when we look at certain things, I'll pull it up here again. Um, if I if I go to new ScreenFlow, new document, a new recording. So I'll see that it's set up to go on my built-in microphone, and I'm already seeing everything right there. If I plug anything else in, a USB mic or a, 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 a USB mixer then these two little uh, levels become, you know, however many levels I'm, I've plugged in, just boom, right there, which is great for me. Um, something else that's kind of obscure but could be useful, this, this thing can be set to start recording after, I, after I've left, after I'm not around. Um, you know, the, the example that they talk about in, um, on, on some of the, the, the webinars is, if you wanted to, to catch a webinar, but you have to be gone, you can open up ScreenFlow on your computer, set it to go, you know, set it to start recording in an hour or two hours, tell it how long it's going to record for, and then leave. And then when the webinar kicks off on your computer, 
ScreenFlow kicks in and records it for you. Um, another option is it has this uh, loop, recording for a loop, and you can set the loop to a set amount of time, and it'll just keep recording, but it won't overwrite for longer than 30 minutes. So you always have the last 30 minutes of whatever it is that you were, you know, that was going on, but you haven't got hours and hours and hours. So it just, it throws away the old stuff. Um, you know, they had a couple of scenarios where that was going to be useful. Uh, for me, that the timer is more useful than setting up a loop, but I could see how maybe a loop would be handy if you were trying to capture just something that was really good, but you didn't know how long it was going to take you to get there and you didn't want to have it going for two or three hours. Um, maybe you've got a presentation that you're working on and you just keep working on the presentation and finally you let it roll for, for two hours while you're trying to, to get it straight. You know, as soon as you know you did a good job, you hit stop and you've got the last 30 minutes. You don't have to, to cut you know, hours and hours out of it, that type of a thing. It, in a general sense, um, it's better for Mac because it's a retina display quality. Camtasia has been catching up because ScreenFlow really took a big lead for a while. Um, and I think Camtasia has now caught up as far as the quality goes with, with video. Um, but for me, uh, the price is right. It's, it's, it's less expensive. It does everything a as well as I'll ever need it to do um, anything. And so I, I, I'm a big fan of it. Um, I've used Camtasia for years, and I, I, was, I would still use Camtasia for a variety of things. But when it came time for me to plop my, my money down out of my wallet <laughs> and not ask the university to buy it for me, but actually get something for myself, that's the one that I decided to go with. I really, really like it a lot. And any, anybody that's on Mac and wanting to do that type of stuff, that, that would be my recommendation. Okay. Um, unless, of course, you guys have a, a license for Camtasia, in which case, do that, <laughs> because that'll be free <laughs> for you. Any questions? I'd be, I've, been, I've been throwing open the possibility to go look at the Lightboard Studio for anybody that's interested in that, um, just because some folks who have yesterday who didn't um, know about the Lightboard, they saw the Lightboard on my videos, and so we walked over there and took a, a quick look at that. And that is available for everybody to use, anybody and everybody. Oh, yeah, when the Lightboard flips the, flips the screen, it looks like I'm using my left hand but I'm, I'm using my right hand. <laughs>